I am Rekha Sriparupu, a neuroradiologist from Manchester. Now, in the next 20 minutes, I will be discussing the imaging features of chordoma and chondrosarcoma and review the preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative imaging in these cases. A good quality standardized skull base imaging protocol is essential in order to enable an adequate read, especially because as we've seen, uh, just seen in the talk before, some patients will have complex tumor extensions and multiple surgeries. Uh, this is the protocol that we use here in Manchester and there is a rationale for using this. Uh, so just to show an example for the coronal T2 with fat suppression that we use is really good in assessing if there's any signal change in the optic chiasm or the nerves. And in terms of using heavily T2-weighted steady-state sequences such as CIS and Fiesta, these are extremely useful in assessing the distance between the tumor to the critical structures, which is the optic chiasm and the nerves, and also in assessing the distance to the brain stem. It is useful in assessing the intradural component, especially if the component is non-enhancing. If we look at the axial T1, three millimeter uh, skull base sequence, this is a beautiful sequence which enables us to use the inherent high T1 signal intensity of fat to delineate the tumor margins. I mean, I believe that this sequence is wasted if we start fat suppressing it. But on the other hand, once contrast is on board, fat becomes an enemy in the skull base, and therefore it's really important to fat suppress the post-contrast images so as to get a good delineation of tumor and enhancement. The first example I'm showing you here is a lesion which is centered on the left petroclival synchondrosis. Now for the purposes of this talk, whenever I talk about high or low signal, I'm usually referring it with respect to the brain stem. So if we look at this lesion, we have a, um, a relatively high T2 signal intensity lesion at the synchondrosis. On T1, we can see that it is iso intense to the brain stem. Uh, see the beauty of the fat delineating the tumor margins on this T1 sequence. Post contrast fat suppressed, we see that the tumor shows fairly avid enhancement with a little bit of heterogeneity. And these are the uh, high resolution CT images demonstrating the destructive nature of the tumor and also quite eloquently showing its location at the petroclival synchondrosis. We see the erosion of the petrous carotid canal as well as of the petrous face. And this is a chondrosarcoma. Another example, this time a midline tumor. Uh, again, quite high signal intensity on T2 compared to brainstem. On T1, this time it is lower in signal. Post contrast, there is relatively very little enhancement within the tumor. So CT here showing the lytic process involving the clivus with a small area of spayed bone. And um, just wanted to show how beautifully the axial cis sequence demonstrates not only the dural breach, so we can see the dura here and we see the dural breach and the intradural tumor component, but as we've known, this is a non-enhancing tumor, and we can see how nicely the, fist, the cis sequence demonstrates the tumor margins with respect to the CSF, as well as its relationship to the basilar artery. Uh, this is a chordoma. This time, we have a lobulated lesion, which is higher up, centered at the level of the posterior clinoid processes. Again, we can see that it is quite high signal intensity on T2 compared to that of brain stem with low T2 signal intensity margins. On T1, it's low in signal, demonstrates fairly heterogeneous enhancement, but avid enhancement. This is a sagittal sheet T1 showing the orientation of the lesion and the distortion of the brain stem. Now, up until this point, it would do very well for a chordoma. Uh, until, of course, I see the CT. And when I see the CT, this is a very uh, classical pattern of matrix mineralization, which definitely would want me to put in a chondrosarcoma. So the differentials here would be between a chondroid chordoma versus a chondrosarcoma. And this midline lesion turned out to be a chondrosarcoma. So CT and MR, I believe, are complementary in skull base imaging. CT is essential to look for bone erosion and also to assess the relation of that erosion to the vessels. It is useful to look at the calcification in the tumor matrix and also excellent to assess the anatomy for endoscopic approach as well as contouring for proton beam. What we use here is we use uh, what I call as a three-in-one uh, CT. So we do a brain lab CTA with bone reconstruction so that we address everything in one study. We know that chordoma and chondrosarcoma are embryologically, they arise from different elements. Now, histologically, we know that they are quite distinct. In terms of location, uh, 
uh, chordomas tend to be typically clival in location, although up to 15% have been reported in the literature to be paramedian. Chondrosarcomas typically tend to be paramedian in location, although there is almost up to 30% in certain uh, uh, reports showing clival um, location. And it's important to know that a number of these studies which I've referenced have shown that there are no conventional MR or CT features that definitively distinguish a chordoma from a chondrosarcoma. So what about DWI? Um, a, a number of studies have looked at both qualitative and quantitative DWI, and one of the papers which I thought was really interesting is this one which was published uh, recently, look, which is a prospective study looking at 105 uh, patients on a single 3T scanner. And what they looked at was they looked at quantitative ADC values of chondrosarcoma versus chordoma on 3T. And they showed that chondrosarcomas tend to have a higher mean ADC value compared to that of chordoma. And they were also able to define a cutoff value which would distinguish a chordoma from a chondrosarcoma with a relatively good specificity. But this study has limitation in that it's a 3T study and quantitative 3T ADC values are not, you know, cannot be really extrapolated directly to clinical 1.5T imaging, which is the workhorse. Another interesting study trying to look at chordoma versus chondrosarcoma. Uh, this is, was published by the Beijing group looking at 210 patients. And what they did was they uh, looked at the radiomic features. So they looked at nearly 2000 radiomic features uh, taking into consideration 11 imaging parameters, and they used contrast T1, T1, as well as T2. And by combining the features of all three sequences and using radiomic analysis, they showed that the multiparametric radiomic signature can accurately differentiate between chordoma and chondrosarcoma, as is shown by this violent plot. So that's about the literature behind uh, the newer advances in trying to distinguish chordoma from chondrosarcoma. Now, coming to the preoperative imaging, what does the surgeon want to know on a preoperative MR? I think one of the most important things is to know where the tumor is, so as to assess if there are any potentially difficult access sites by the standard endonasal approach, or would it need an additional approach? Uh, by this, you know, the tumor sites involving the cavernous sinus, middle cranial fossa, lateral skull base, and orbit, and also tricky tumor hiding behind surgical scar tissue. Is there an intradural tumor component? And if there is, what are its neurovascular relations? Are there any tumor sites which would have implications with stability following surgery, such as tumor involving the inferior clivus and occipital condyles or the upper cervical spine? And finally, anatomical threats to the endoscopic surgeon. If I show, um, so just an example to illustrate, uh, this, is, this is another patient with a right-sided uh, uh, chondrosarcoma. And here we can see that the tumor is both at the lateral aspect of the petrous carotid as well as the medial aspect. There is the tumor component extending into the prepontine cistern and indenting the brainstem tumor within the cavernous sinus, and also tumor extending all the way down into the occipital bone on either side of the hypoglossal canal. CT here showing erosion of the medial and the lateral wall of the petrous canal. And these are all really relevant features for the surgeon to know. What does the oncologist want to know from the preoperative imaging? So they are very interested in knowing what the distance of the uh, tumor is to the critical structures. And by critical structures, I mean the optic chiasm uh, and the optic nerves, as well as the brainstem, because an at least five millimeter clearance from the optic chiasm and a three millimeter clearance from the brainstem is needed to enable proton therapy. And also, they would want to know the disease sites, not only on the post-op, uh, but also the pre-op disease sites, because both of these are included in the treatment target volumes. Moving forwards to uh, intraoperative MRI, uh, imaging and intraoperative MRI, it goes without saying that uh, when we are reading an intraoperative MRI, we really need to know what the pre-op imaging looks like. And it always helps having the chat with the surgeon before the surgery. The neuroradiologist also needs to know whether the skull base has been reconstructed. And if it has been reconstructed, we need to know what type and what materials, because the imaging appearances vary depending upon the materials that are used. And finally, what the surgeon's perspective is on the resection that has been achieved. What the surgeon would like to hear is that if there is any residual tumor, uh, if there is residual tumor, where is the residual tumor? And what is the relationship of the residual tumor to the brainstem and optic chiasm? 
And if skull base reconstruction has been done, what does the flap look like and what are the complications? So this is here, uh, the same patient that we've seen before with a right-sided chondrosarcoma. We've seen that this, uh, he was operated at an outside institution, middle fossa approach. We can see the post-surgical changes along the middle fossa with a mixture of low signal intensity along the surgical axis track through the tumor. And this is where the tumor has been resected. The prepontine, uh, the CP pontine has also been resected. And on T1, we see post-surgical changes with blood products as well as non-enhancement in the surgical tract. Looking at this, it's easily uh, appreciable that the residual tumor is left behind in the cavernous sinus as well as on either side of the petrous carotid. What is important to note is also the small volume residual behind the surgical axis. The patient came here for an introp MRI, and these are the introp images showing that the skull base has been reconstructed. There's a nasal foley in place. They've got spongistin in, and there is the flap with the nice, beautifully enhancing flap on the post-contrast images. We see post-surgical changes in the petrous apex, and we note that all of the tumor, right from the level of the cavernous sinus that we saw before down to the hypoglossy canal has been resected. So this is the uh, post, uh, the, just a comparison from the pre-op image. But uh, when we go back and look at this, we note that there is a small volume of tumor. This is quite nicely demonstrated on the Fiesta sequence here. And we see that there is a small volume tumor, which is behind the post-surgical scar tissue, um, which is now seen as an area of low T2 signal intensity and fairly homogeneous enhancement because this is now a few months post-op. So coming to the post-operative imaging, uh, a sagittal T1 sequence demonstrating the different layers of reconstruction here. So what we have going from in out is the uh, area of low T1 signal intensity with a bit of high T1 signal, which is a combination of blood and hemostatic materials. And then we see the enhancing nasal septal flap, following which is the spongistin and the nasal foley in place. So compare that to that of a reconstruction which has been done in an outside hospital. We can see that the different uh, layers of reconstruction are, are different between the two studies. And here they have also used fat in addition. But it is important that when fat is used that we do use fat suppression sequences because otherwise it can be difficult to distinguish where the flap ends, the fat starts, uh, and if there is any residual tumor. Um, just for the purposes of the radio, re, neuroradiology and radiology colleagues in this group, I just put towards this schematic showing the different layers of the reconstruction, which start with an inlay fascia lata flap, and this is what is done at our institution here, lined by um, fibrin glue, following which we've got the vascularized pedicle nasal septal flap, uh, and then a bit of glue, and finally spongistin, everything held together in place by a foley. Now, sometimes the intracranial intraoperative bed is left as it is. Uh, here, sometimes they tend to put in a bit of spongistin and surgicil. At other centers, they can use fat. It is important to know that so that we can adequately assess it in the uh, intraop phase. The appearances of the flap are very variable. Now, this is a busy slide, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to go in detail, but what I would like to say is that the imaging appearances of the flap vary depending upon the type of the reconstruction that has been done and depending on whether this is the immediate post-op or the uh, late period. And therefore, it is really important to know this. Uh, just an example here showing a patient who had been operated for a growing chordoma, uh, previous biopsy, we can see that this has been reconstructed with a nasal septal flap. What we see here as a low T2 signal intensity linear structure is actually fascia lata. Uh, usually we only see one line. We are seeing two lines here because in this particular patient, they've had both an inlay and onlay fascia lata. Um, axial cyst sequence demonstrating spongistin uh, intracranially along with surgicil. We can see the contours of the surgicil along the subarachnoid space. And this is what tells us that this is uh, blood and surgicil uh, as opposed to tumor. And finally, the post-contrast, we don't see the enhancing flap, but it, sometimes in the intraoperative imaging, we may not see the enhancing And all I wanted to say in uh, my summary is that Optimal imaging protocol is absolutely essential in order to enable an adequate read. And also that the best management of these complex cases is by a multidisciplinary team approach where we understand each other's needs.